Welcome to an amazing edition of Rebellion's educational series. Today we're going to conquer a number of aviation issues, from vertical takeoff and landing, to neural networks, to a host of other issues with the brilliant Peter Schmidt, whose neural network paper from MIT I want to actually jump to submarines on later in the show. So uh, we're going to go all over the place today. But Peter, first, eHang. The stock has gone up like a rocket ship, no pun intended. Yes. Uh, is there value in eHang? Do you have an opinion on that stock? Uh, no, I don't think there's value in eHang. I think this is a bubble phenomenon. Um, GameStop, eHang, you know, we, we're in a bubble economy. And eHang is flashy. And yeah. whatever captures attention, captures some investment dollars, and that captures momentum. It's kind of that simple. No, no, without a doubt. Uh, my friend, uh, Edward Mippy, who runs Vanguard's AI, calls them predator uh, AI companies, companies that push AI, and they're good at pushing AI, and they get investor dollars because of the cachet. And so your point really is that eHang has just done a great job with cachet, because VTOL is as hot as anything right now. It's so hot. Yeah, when yeah. I saw, you know, eHang on the news for the 19th time in two days, I said, I got to talk to my boy, Peter Schmidt, and see what's going on in the VTOL industry right now. Yeah, so eHang has a design that works, but it's very limited. And what it can do, um, it's not clear that it can do anything that people really want to pay for in significant volume. And, you know, with other technologies, significant volume doesn't matter, right? You can kind of build something cruddy and fool around with niche applications and learn. And in fact, that's where a lot of disruptive innovation comes from. Um, but in aviation where you're flying people, you have to certify yeah. aircraft. And that's of course, this is no different from a Ford, you know, or a Boeing. This is a... Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, so it, how far are we from New York to Boston in, you know, half an hour, 25 minutes? Uh, we're about five years away. Okay. Um, we, uh, so, you know, the certification cost means that you got to sell a lot of aircraft on the backside to have an ROI or it's not a business. It's no. just some sort of weird investor funded charity for engineers and airplane geeks. Um, and I've seen a lot of that. Uh, I got into aviation picking up the pieces from the very light jet bubble burst. Um, people thought these little jets were going to fill the skies. Now they think these little eVTOLs are going to fill the skies. Um, you know, unless the aircraft enables a business model that can run profitably, you're not going to sell enough, right? And there's one major business model you can run profitably, and that's regular old airliners. And then in general aviation, that's not profitable. You know, the, the private jets, um, the only people making money off those are the people who charge a fixed monthly fee to maintain it for people. It's like a timeshare in a condo. Um, the people who own the timeshare in the jet or own the whole jet, they're losing their pants. But, you know, they get what my, uh, my buddy Bill Herp at Linear Air calls non-financial rewards to aircraft ownership. Yeah. So all of the private jet world and general aviation is driven by people making a, a non-monetary decision to buy it. So, you know, you look at um, these eVTOL aircraft and you say, well, you know, they don't go very fast. I mean, eHang will go like 22 miles. It'll go 60 miles an hour. I mean, there are, I think there are Tour de France bikers who can beat that. Um, but uh, in, a, in a different industry, you could have something with, you know, with a novel technology. It's all electric. And you could sort of like, well, 22 miles, eh, you know, I, I could do, I can do carnival rides with it, which they're doing. They're doing carnival rides with it. You know, maybe I could hop people across an island, maybe in Seattle, I could go back and forth. Maybe go across a river. I mean, they're talking about just going across a river. Which do we need to make this worthwhile for the mass market? Well, it's a combination, but really you, you got to go over 200 miles an hour. Um, oh my God, that's tremendously fast. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, you got to go for more than I have an a fear hour. of heights, speeds, everything pretty much. <laughs> well, then, you know, uh, you may not want to fly. No, um, I, have, I have an obsession with aviation, though, which actually brings me to our next segment in our show, which is uh, B-52 maintenance. I'm sorry to yeah. introduce it at the beginning of the show, but, you know, we've got this aging bomber crew, but we're going to use it for another 20 to as many as 30 more years. And so People if you have, have a bomber, aircraft flying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's say you have a bomber that lands in the Marshall Islands and maintenance needs to be done. Can we use augmented reality to perform certain maintenance issues? Yeah. By, I'm, I'm so, yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm so glad you asked about this. I actually and, ran. And, and not just that. Can we have, can we teach new engineers, the old engineers traits? So an old engineer can come and just, you know, place, replace this gasket valve, but then the new engineer 
can he, can we create a, an augmented reality program for him to put on the goggles and say, okay, this is how I replace the gasket valve. So the, yes, the answer is yes. And the cool thing about this for, for people who may not be f fully uh, understanding what we mean by augmented reality and goggles, right? So you put on a head mounted display, uh, some kind of goggles or helmet maybe with a visor and a computer projects images on that display that overlay the reality you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at the outside of this B-52 in the Marshall Islands and you gotta find the broken part, it actually overlays a diagram of what's behind the skin of the aircraft. You can see, it's like x-ray vision, you can see inside it. And not only that, it can show you the parts that are causing problems, it light them up for you. So you can actually look, or if there's scheduled maintenance, you can see the parts that are due to be maintained, right? They light up orange and you're like, oh. I'm changing the oil in a B-52. I mean, a, a, a Bombardier certified maintenance man might not have any clue how to do that. So can you put on goggles and just you know, have it walk them through? Yes, in theory. In practice, to pull that off, you have to certify the augmented reality system. Just like I was talking about certification for a whole aircraft, same deal. The Air Force, in this case, since they operate a B-52, is going to have to certify that a technician from who knows how to maintain Bombardier aircraft using this augmented reality software and display can provably and safely conduct the maintenance using that technology. So but again, I mean, how hard is it to write this code and to create this system? Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty hard. Um, it's not without, you know, it's not beyond what people have proven capable to do, but it's not a trivial task because of certification, yeah. right? Anytime you put human life on the line in an aircraft, the reason our system is so safe is every aspect of it is certified. Yeah. You know, when, when, a when a mechanic works on the airplane, they sign every time, they sign their name saying, I have done this properly. And if it turns out that they lied or were negligent, they lose their license, they lose their livelihood. Right? And the people who trained that mechanic, same thing. They signed, I trained this mechanic properly. And the training materials that they used to train them were signed off by somebody who developed them and the FAA approved. Yep, that training, that training material is gonna work. So these, this augmented reality system will have to be certified by the FAA, the Air Force, whoever wants, whoever's the cognizant authority. Um, so if I'm the Air it, Force and I wanna create this system, yeah. how do I go? I mean, I need to hire people to take the pictures. And then I need to hire or I need to bring in the maintenance people to go through the steps. And yeah. I mean, how well, many people would you estimate the Air Force would need to hire for all of this to be done? I mean, we're talking, you know, plus a thousand, plus a hundred. Um, well, it's, it's on the, or it's one of these software projects that's probably 200 people for six years. Yeah. Is my estimating. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. That's uh that's uh, very interesting. So getting to the third segment of our show, sorry to yes. jump on, no, but these, these shows are very condensed. 2021, nobody has any attention span. ADHD right. has, uh, you know, it's the plague. Um, uh, so I want to know about your neural network paper and yeah. using neural networks on mines for submarines. Uh, do you yes. think, do you think we could use neural networks uh, to find mines? For submarine deterrence. So um, neural networks, that technology that I, I did my um, MIT paper on my bachelor's thesis actually, uh, is at the heart of all the machine learning that is currently being deployed. Well, can we also use the neural networks for bomber maintenance as well uh, to guess which parts will have issues or do you think that's something no. that, no, it's no. A different okay. knowledge, it's a different knowledge domain. Okay, uh, I mean, you could, but you wouldn't get much benefit. Uh, whereas right. finding mines, if there are acoustic signatures or other signatures that a submarine can measure, yeah. and you can get enough data so that you can tease out subtle patterns in that data, then yeah, a machine learning neural network uh, has been proven to be, they're getting more and more effective over time at being able to pull those signals out. So yeah, you could. And what you would do is you would write a system that's processing the incoming data in real time and alert whoever's conning the submarine, hey, there's a possible mine over here. Do mm. you think yeah. there's any chance the B-52 program will continue on 30 plus years? Or? Yes, absolutely. And this is one of my favorite things about aviation that's different from a lot of tech we're used to. When you come up with an optimum aircraft design, uh, it doesn't change. It doesn't, it doesn't get obsoleted. B-52, you can't really do much better than the B-52 for the missions it does. And that's why they haven't replaced it. 
Like, yeah, any any aerospace engineer could come You're up. You're saying with that for the science of flight, for the desired, you know, output, the B fifty two is the perfect model. Exactly, it's optimized. There's, you know, what the oh. physics of air, the physics of jet fuel, the physics of aluminum, they haven't changed in seventy years. <laughs> and they're I not should say, I should, I should mention by the way that Peter's paper in neural networks at MIT did win the uh, David uh, Adler Prize, which was uh, very impressive. Yeah. So. yeah. Anyway, well, Peter, this has been a phenomenal episode. I hope to have you on again soon and uh, talk with you about B-52 some more. I, I couldn't be more thankful for the time you gave. You were absolutely A-plus today. So uh, have a great day and stay safe, sir. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye. Okay,